guy's going to talk about the kind of, I, I guess you're carrying on this theme about what we know and what we don't know about the impact of mobile technology, which is very pervasive within civic tech, uh, the impact that's having. So Guy Grossman, University of Pennsylvania, over to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks uh, Mike and Gemma and Becca for uh, inviting me to talk about uh, some of the research that I've been uh, doing uh, on uh, mobile civil tech. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in the next 30 minutes is to take stock of what kind of we know and what we don't know uh, in a very particular type of uh, mobile civil tech. We're going to look at uh, platforms that allow citizens to communicate with uh, politicians, and we're going to do it in the context of low-income countries. So though I'm aware that when we talk about civic tech, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's much bigger than just looking at communication from citizens to, to politicians, and I know many of you study areas, do I need, do I need that? Uh, okay. um, so I know that many of you work in areas uh, other than low-income countries, but I still hope that, you know, some of the lessons uh, that I can share with you will be relevant to, to the work of, of many people here. So before I start talking about some of the promises and pitfalls of mobile uh, civil tech in, in low-income countries, uh, it's good to first like, define the problem that we're trying to solve uh, uh, with, with mobile civil tech before we can uh, you know, take stock of whether we are able to, to uh, solve some of these problems. So in, in thinking about in, in thinking about the problem that we're trying to solve, a good starting point will be like a basic idea from democratic theory, this kind of idea that to the extent that politicians and government do uh, uh, what they think, to some extent, what they think the constituents want them to do, okay, to the extent that that is the case, then the quality of democratic institutions as a tool of representation really depends on the quality of political communication, okay? So when we think about political communication, one way of thinking about political communication is thinking about the will and ability of citizens to communicate their interest, their preference, their need to uh, their elected officials, okay? But we know that in many, uh, many low-income countries, and you know, maybe also in, in high-income countries, many low-income countries, there's barriers to articulate people's interests and preferences, okay? And these barriers are very important because for us to come up with applications and platforms uh, that, you know, can increase civic voice, we need to understand also these, these barriers, okay? And, and one barrier, important barrier, is that we have uh, low um, uh, or weak communication channels between citizens and their representatives uh, in, in, in government, okay? And this leads to what political scientists uh, like to call uh, a low equilibrium. So when we, we think about low equilibrium, it's, it's two uh, uh, manifestations of these weak channels of uh, communication. Uh, these, the, these weak channels of communication uh, uh, stem uh, to a large part from the fact that uh, traditional aggregators of interests, like political parties, like unions, like civil society groups, are kind of weak, not very institutionalized, uh, mostly located in the capitals and have very little outreach to the hinterland, okay? So, so one problem is around, serv uh, around service delivery. So, so think about the, the following example. So say you have a, a district in a country that I study uh, uh, quite uh, thoroughly, Uganda, uh, and the district is responsible for health, education, for water. And there's, you know, these villages, you know, located 20, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles out of the district headquarters. Now the district might know, like in general, there's problems of service delivery, but they don't necessarily know specifically when a teacher doesn't show up to work, when a nurse doesn't show up to work, when uh, a, a doctor asks for, uh, for a payment for a treatment that should be subsidized, or a nurse is asking for a payment for medicine that should be delivered for free, okay? And these are not a small problem. I mean, if you will do a random audit in a school and a schools and clinics in East Africa, 30% of teachers are not present in the school. 25% of nurses are not present in the, in the clinics, okay? The problem is that because of weak communication channels, the government doesn't really know which teacher didn't show up. They don't know which clinic is closed when it's supposed to be open. The problem also is that the citizens know that the government doesn't know, you know, about the teacher that doesn't show up, which means 
that because the citizens kind of know that the government don't know, they have very low expectations. Because the citizens have very low expectations, and the government knows that the citizens know that they don't know, the, the government doesn't have a strong incentive to go and seek for this information. So we're in a low equilibrium where the government doesn't know what's the problem, the citizens know that they don't know, they know that the citizens don't know, and we all stay in like this like low, low equilibrium. Okay? Uh, another problem which people don't uh, fully kind of appreciate of the, the, the problem of weak communication channel is parties that are not really programmatic. So parties don't offer programs, so they're not competing on like a marketplace of ideas because they don't really know what citizens want. If they don't know what citizens want and what are their preferences, so they campaign on very general issues like, oh, we'll all fight corruption, we'll all bring development, okay? And when parties are not offering voters any differenti differentiation, what, the, what voters tend to do is to vote according to tribal lines, and that, 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 that adds a whole host of other problems, okay? So these are some of the problems of weak communication channels. And then there's another big problem, which is political communication or political access is not distributed evenly. So we know women and poor, the less educated, uh, have less opportunities to raise their voice than uh, the men and, and, and the, the better educated people. Okay, so, so these are the problems. And now we, you know, we have this big revolution of, of, uh, in, 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 in the developing world where we completely jump, we do this leapfrog, uh, from uh, landlines that no one has, we have now a world in which uh, also computers people don't really have access, so we know only 10-15% of African, for example, ever use the computer, but 85% of our population has access to mobile phones. So this is kind of really exciting, and the question becomes, can we use the fact that so many people are now connected with the mobile technology to address some of these challenges, okay? So can we use mobile technology to increase political accountability, to improve, for, for example, service delivery, can we use them to uh, flatten political access to marginalized populations? Now, the second point is not a minor one. When I started, you know, trying to uh, sell governments and donors and civil society groups in Africa on the idea of mobile civil tech, you know, one of the pushbacks that I got is like, hey, you're, you're just going to be privileging the already privileged. Because if you're going to allow communication that is based on, say, mobile technology, you're going to just privilege the, the men and the better educated that are more um, kind of savvy in using uh, technology. So a big question into the research agenda is whether uh, mobile tech, mobile civil tech can, uh, uh, can flatten access and, and be an equalizer. Okay? So what I'm going to do after we kind of, you know, set up the stage of what the problem that we're trying to face, uh, I'm going to describe in the next, in the next few minutes, um, based on research that we've been conducting in the last four or five years, what we think we know and what we know that we don't know, okay? And, and use that to kind of chart going into the future what do we think, what I think should be some of the work that will, uh, that people that care about this space should be focusing uh, on. I just should mention before we go into the, what we know and what we don't know, uh, that at least in the context of the countries that I'm working at, uh, we're still in a G2 world, okay? We're not in the G4, we, so the fact that we have 85% of the people, 90% uh, in some countries have access to a mobile technology, that doesn't mean that they can go uh, online. It doesn't mean that they can contact their representative Twitter and Facebook. We're still in a G2 world, okay? And, the projection is that at least in the next five, ten years, we're still going to be, to the most part, in a G2 world outside the, the main cities. So a lot of the solutions that we're trying to do are with the G2 world. So maybe a lot of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll be discussing will be less relevant once we all get connected. But, you know, we don't have the patience to wait ten years till everyone is connected. So, so, so bear with me. Okay. So the first lesson that we learned, okay, and this was a big if. Uh, this was a big question before we started this, like, engaging this, this whole, like, research agenda. Uh, so we know, I think, or we think we know, that there's an underlying demand to contact one representative using mobile civil tech platforms, okay? So this is based on, you know, several studies. I'm going to give just uh, two examples. So one uh, example is uh, 
We, we did an, uh, uh, a survey with a national representative sample in, in Uganda. We collected a lot of inf information about demographics. We also collected a lot of information about uh, the engagement, the political engagement, using traditional forms of engagement, like p participating in, in, uh, in uh, rallies, contacting the representative uh, through mail, uh, voting. Okay? And uh, at the end of the survey, the survey was with close to 4,000 people. We gave them a flyer that says, hey, if you want to contact your MP, here's a, here's, a, here's a number you can text. We used a very basic platform. I think we used the uh, frontline SMS. And we'll, we'll, we said we'll, we'll deliver the, the, the messages. Okay? And we got 5% uh, that sent a text message. So 5% is, you know, sometimes I present people say, yeah, that's not a lot. Actually, I mean, I think there's a lot of us here that would be happy 5% of the population would be using our platforms. But that's also equivalent to, you know, primary, the, the share of people that go and vote in primaries in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in elections in the United States. So that's not a small number, okay? Another, another project, which is a very recent project uh, in northern Uganda, uh, we created a platform that enabled citizens to complain uh, when, this is mostly about service delivery deficiencies, when the teacher doesn't show up, when the, the, the health clinic is closed, we implemented it as an experiment in 100 villages. There's 100 villages control, and we're following these villages in the next year or two. And in the first six months of implementing this project, we're getting about, we're averaging about 60 messages that are coming in uh, from each of the 100 uh, villages in six months. So that's about 10 messages per village. And these villages are, the population is about 100 and 150 adult uh, people in each village. So that's a, that's a high high uptake, and that's on a monthly basis, okay? So one good lesson that we've learned, there's an underlying demand to use these technologies. But we've also learned another lesson uh, that, you know, and I think many of you in the room have learned this lesson in the past, uh, if you build them, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will come, okay? So we have also experienced uh, with, with platforms that we implemented that didn't catch. So, for example, we implemented a platform together with the Ugandan parliament and the, uh, there was a, um, another partner was the National Democratic Institute, the international NGO based in, in D.C. The platform was a very sophisticated uh, a platform that uh, enables citizens to send a text message, it tags it, uh, and, and MPs can open it uh, on, on, on a dashboard that allows them to take all the messages that come in and, and look at like, you know, queries, how many messages about health, how about education, how many in each month. Super sophisticated. In order to market the platform, the, the, the parliament aired 30-second ads in 19 languages over a year, twice daily. Okay? And they got less than 2,000 messages uh, over a population that we estimate that heard the, 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 the radio spot of about 10 million people. Then there's another study that I was uh, involved in Nigeria where uh, the, the idea was to get people um, to um, report uh, corruption. Uh, this was uh, marketed through blast text messages that arrived uh, like f in, 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 in about like two weeks period, uh, sending out 700,000 text messages to people with an, uh, uh, you know, give, saying if you, if you uh, can, if you want to report uh, uh, a corruption uh, incident, uh, it's usually kind of a bribe when somebody asks you to pay for a service that the government should be providing uh, at, at no cost. And, and the, message, the, the platform generated you know, 800 messages over the two-week period. Um, and again, this is less than like 0.1% uh, uptake. Okay? So if, if you build them, it won't, doesn't mean that they will come. And a lot of the research that we're doing in this space is trying to understand why some platforms catch and some platforms uh, don't catch. So I will, I will talk about this uh, also in, in the next few minutes. Another important lesson that we've learned, and this is a very important lesson that we've learned, is ICT uh, platforms. Platforms that allow citizens to contact their representative in, in government have a real potential of flattening access. Okay? So, what do, so, so they, they could be reducing inequality in access to uh, politicians, okay? So I'll give an example of, of what do I mean by flattening access, okay? So you remember when I told you that we did this like national representative survey, um, we asked people about the demographics 
This allowed us to uh, construct a measure of margi how marginalized people are. So, you know, you know, women are more marginalized, uh, less educated, more marginalized, poor people more marginalized, people that live in distant areas. So we create an index of marginalization. But then we asked them also about the political engagement. So we took all the forms of engagement and created the index of engagement, okay? And what you can see here on the left is the more marginalized you are, the less engaged, okay? So that's, that's the negative trend, okay? These are traditional forms of participation. On the right, what we see is the same marginalization as a function of the show of people that send a text message to the representative in, in, in government, okay? And what we see that this is that this is straight, okay? This is a straight line, meaning more marginalized people are not less likely to send a text message, okay? So one way of thinking about, one way of thinking about whether this can flatten access is to think about the share of women and poor among uh, civic tech users as compared to traditional forms of engagement. So the, the right way to think about it is not if, th say 40% say of, of SMS senders are women. Say we, we still are not in like uh, gender parity. But also say that when a politician comes to a village, only 20% of the people that get up and speak are women, okay? So if only 20% of the people that get up and speak are women uh, in the community meeting, but 40% of those that send messages are women, then we can say that we added another channel that flattens access, okay? Even if we don't get uh, parity, okay? Now, we think that the reason that this is the case is because women and poor and less educated value this form of participation because a lot of politics in low-income countries is about, tr it's, it's about traveling to the district, traveling to the capital, it's very personalized, but uh, marginalized population value the ability to stay in the village. They also value the fact that a lot of these messaging are impersonal in nature, okay? Now, we thought that this is about value, so we wanted to test that. So we ran another experiment, and what we did in the experiment, we, uh, we randomized the cost of sending the text message. So for, tho for those of you who uh, uh, don't, don't work in uh, uh, low-income countries, people, to the most part, don't have data plans. Every time they need to make a call or send a text message, they, they will buy a scratch card and they will upload money. So sending text messages is, is, is costly. We randomized the cost, okay? And the idea was to see what happens when, uh, when we vary the cost of contacting one, uh, one uh, representative. So what we found was very interesting. Two interesting findings. The first one is that when you increase the cost, we have less people that participate. So, so that's, like, that's kind of normal. It's, a, it's like any good and any service more expensive reduces the cost. But in most services and goods in the world, when you increase the price, the first, pe the first people that drop will be the marginalized people, okay? Because they're more price sensitive. What we found in our experiments is that that was not the case. That the marginalized people were not dropping first, okay? Uh, they were not, so everyone was like, messaging less when the, 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 the cost was high, but it's not that the marginalized people were dropping at a higher rate, suggesting that they place a high value on this form of participation. So that's another good news, okay? That there's a potential of using mobile civil tech to flatten access. But after every good news, there's some bad news. And the fact that uh, marginalized populations value this form of connection doesn't necessarily mean that every time we will put in a platform, uh, it will be an equalizer, okay? So, participation of marginalized groups is far from guaranteed. So, I wanna go back to uh, the experiment that we did uh, with the uh, parliament of Uganda where they marketed the, uh, the service through year-long radio spots 30 seconds, twice daily, over a year, okay? So I want you to focus on this graph, which is uh, fascinating, because we're talking about the same population, just different marketing. On the right, we're gonna look at the share of women that send SMS when we gave them a flyer, we contacted them directly, we gave them a flyer, said, hey, you can contact um, your members of parliament. So we're talking about the same parliament, the same country, the same population. When the, it was a direct invitation, Almost, I think you can see it here, almost 50% of senders were women. 
when the marketing strategy was radio spots, the share of women was 18%. Okay? That's kind of a big drop. Okay? So, so we were trying to understand why, why is that the case? Okay? Why, why is the marketing channel so important? So it could be that women don't have access to radio. Okay? That could be the case. So we tested that. So we did another big survey, nationally representative, to try and understand who had access to radio, who heard the messages. And what we found is that men and women were equally likely to hear messages on uh, the, the radio spots. The big difference was that whereas men, when they hear a radio spot that says, hey, there's a new service, now you can contact your MP, they're like, oh, this is relevant, I'm going to contact my MP. Women heard the same message and didn't think that this is relevant for them. Oh, there's a new service, that's, you know, that's for the guys, they should, they should do that. Okay? So we're, we're learning that the, the type of marketing is important and specifically the importance of personalizing the invitation to participate in these contexts is super important. So we thought that this is the case. We thought that personalizing the request is important based on this information, but we, we wanted to study the deep, okay? So, so, you know, Becca was talking before about evidence-based, so we said, okay, it's a hunch, let's study the deep. So we ran another experiment, okay? And what we did, we sent text messages to people in order to encourage them to contact the MPs, okay? But we, we varied the context of the text message that encouraged them. So in one of the treatments, we told people, hey, you know, there's a new service, you should contact your MP. And in another treatment, we used their name, okay? So we said, hey, Matt, hey, John, hey, Becca, you can contact now your MP. So the only difference was adding the name. So as you can imagine, you know, names is, you know, work. So everyone, you know, in the treatment where we use name, everyone sent more messages. But what's fascinating is that with women, the treatment effect was double the men, okay? So, you know, for, for women, the personal invitation had a much larger effect than, than men. So for us, this suggests that we did another thing, uh, which is also interesting. So this, the, 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 the one with the names goes into what we call like uh, subjective or subjective efficacy. You believe that you can actually make a change, okay? Um, we did another experiment in which we, in the message, we said, your MP wants to hear from you, okay? So the idea is to give them a, you know, can increase their confidence that on the other side there's someone is, that is interested. And again, when we told people that the MPs want to hear from them, huge up, huge uptake, about 50% increase in the messaging rate, okay? But again, for women, significantly higher for, for men, okay? So, so a lot of lessons about the fact that by itself, even though marginalized populations value this form of communication a lot, by itself, it doesn't guarantee their participation, and there's a lot of things that we need to think of, like the marketing and how personalized the invitation to participate is. Okay, so I spoke a lot about the side of the users. Let's talk a bit about the government or the side of the recipient, because we're also learning that the recipient identity is super crucial, okay? Uh, so two ways of uh, thinking about how the message recipient is important. One is to think about level of government, one to think about even within the level of government, whether we're talking about, for example, politicians or bureaucrats. Uh, our studies, I'm going to go over this a bit fast, our studies show that people are much more likely to contact local governments than national parliament because of what the government actually does. So it's much easier to contact about what a world that is broken, uh, health, you know, the quality of teachers, uh, health clinics that are always closed. It's much more difficult for citizens to message to contact the MPs in Parliament, because in order to do that, you need to know what's on the docket of Parliament, what's the debate, what sides people are taking, and what are they going to vote on, and, and people, people are not good at that. For that, you actually need, need civil society, okay? So the only times I contact my representative in Congress is when I get an email or some fa Facebook post of some, some group that says, hey, you know, uh, Parliament is going to vote, Congress is going to vote on uh, defunding Planned Parenthood, make your voice heard. Okay, so somebody needs to mobilize me. This is not the case. When this is not the case uh, in, in the countries that I study, we're seeing very low participation rates in national parliaments, but it's also a lesson for us of the importance of bringing in civil society. Uh, the second one was, is, a, is a fascinating uh, finding. We run the same platform. We implemented exactly the same platform 
in districts in Uganda, we're talking about the same platform, the same uh, country, the same level of government, the same government responsibilities. In some places, we gave the platform uh, tablets, the access to the platform to bureaucrats. In, in some districts, we gave it to councillors, to politicians, okay? And we wanted to see what's happening. And what we found is significantly higher uptake, significantly greater involvement when we gave it to, to the bureaucrats, okay? So when we gave it to the bureaucrats, people anticipate that the bureaucrats will respond. They anticipated that they have the knowledge, the know-how, the technical ability to address some of their problems, and they were sending messages in high rates. When, we send it, when the platform was given to local government, to, to politicians, people didn't think that they have the power, didn't think that they will have maybe the interest, and they weren't sending the messages. And you know, the interesting thing is like we also do a lot of callback surveys, so part of what we do in the research, we'll call back people that are users. And in the ones with the local government, we called back and we said, hey, we saw you send one message, but then you never send. And people would answer, the answer we'd get a lot is like, I sent once, never heard back, will never send again. Which leads me to the next um, uh, insight that we've learned through the research, which is civic mobile, uh, mobile civic tech can create a platform of communication, but by itself it doesn't make a non-responsive government responsive. It's just a platform. Okay? If I, and now I can communicate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that on the other, ha on the other side there's someone that is recipient, to, uh, so that is responsive to the message, that will do anything with the message. And what we've learned that if politicians don't want this platform, they can derail the process by simply not responding. <coughs> so you'll send once and you won't hear back, you'll send maybe twice, you won't hear back, and that's it, you'll never send again. Okay? So we're learning that by itself, Creating a platform that allows citizens' voice is not a panacea for the problem if you have a non-responsive government. What we're discovering that it's important to think not only about knowledge and information that is passed, but also about government incentives, okay? There has to be a political economy analysis behind what we're trying to do when we do uh, mobile civil tech, okay? So we need to think about how to change incentives. And changing incentives is not that easy. Okay? So here's one way of changing incentives that we came up in one of our studies. Not that easy, highly effective. And this is a, the idea that common knowledge is key. So do you remember before that we were talking about the, local, the government that doesn't know what's going on and the citizens know that it doesn't know and it knows that the citizens don't know? So let's, let's, let's just flip that. Okay? Now, let's create a platform that enables us to push information to the government so now the government knows. But we want also citizens to know that they have this information. Okay, so the citizens know that the government know. But we want the government to know that the citizens know that it has this information. Okay, so we want the citizens, so we want the government to have this information. We want citizens to know that it has this information. We want the government to know that citizens know that it now has this information. Okay, so we want to create this common knowledge because if the government knows that everyone knows that it has this information, if it doesn't operate on that basis, you know, there might be implications. People, now there's more expectation, people might punish the, 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 the people that have that information and are not operating on basis of that information. Okay, so we want them to know that they know that we know. Okay, that's kind of the logic of common knowledge. The truth is it's not very easy to do in a G2. It's easier to do in a, in a world of internet where you can post you know, a, a website where all the messages that come in, the response rate, and everyone can see, everyone can log in. Much easier to do, much more difficult to do in the G2 world. Okay? Uh, one of the things that we've di discovered that was very effective is to hold community dialogues where we invite the government officials to the communities to discuss, here's all the messages that, we, that came in in the last like three months, we do it on a quarterly basis. Here's the messages that came in the last few months. Here's what we did. This we solved. This we couldn't solve because this is the national government and not us. So there's a lot of dialogue with what the government can and can't do. And we're seeing that every time we're holding these, these community dialogues, the rate just like just jumps after that because people feel that the government is much more account accountable to them because they know that they have the information and they, 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 the government is much more sensitive to the fact that now citizens have this information. The problem is, is that it's a bit costly. The plus side 
is that it brings the virtual world and the real world together. Okay? If we think that by creating a, you know, platforms, you know, we, we, we can somehow eliminate the real world because everything will operate on like the, you know, some, some servers, we're wrong. Okay? Especially for those study of us working in developing countries. At some point, the virtual world and the real world need to kind of uh, connect and, and that's when we get uh, the best uh, outcomes. Two other uh, uh, lessons that we, we learned uh, before I move to the things that we don't know yet. Um, one is that the sender uh, uh, anonymity uh, confidentiality is key. When we now uh, uh, market a new platform, so we know we don't do it on the radio, we need to send people out to villages to hold community meetings, we've learned that. We had a painful lesson, but we've learned that. What we also have learned that when we do a demo, we actually need to show people that when you send a text message and it opens at the site of the government, we, we show them that it opens as a case in a case tracking system and it can't trace back to the number. They want to see, they don't believe us, they want to see, they always think that they can actually trace it back to the number. So showing them, like showing them that you can't, that it really only opens as a case in a case tracking system is just absolutely fundamental for getting people the confidence to use the platform. And the reason this is so important is because people are not always aware of the fact that there's a social cost of complaining. People are afraid that if I will complain about the teacher that is abusive, she will not recommend that my child advances to second, secondary uh, uh, education, to, to, to high school. There's a fear that if I will complain about the nurse that was abusive, they won't treat my child the next time around. So it's not just about the monetary cost of complaining, there's also a social cost of complaining. Anonymity is key. But what we've learned is that if you really like, make everyone aware that this is an anonymous and impersonal uh, system, there's also another side benefit, sorry, which is that centers will start using the platform in ways that are very, very different from the communication that they have using face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. So speak to politicians in a, lo a lot of uh, uh, developing countries and they say that they avoid meeting uh, uh, their constituents because every time they meet their constituents, the things that they ask for are personal favors. They'll ask for you know, school fees for their kids, to pay the medical bills. You, know, you have your moment with your politician, that's what you ask for. But because this is impersonal communication, you're not gonna ask for like, the medical bills when there's anonymity. So people are asking things like better schools, better healthcare, better roads, which is really interesting because by changing the mode of communication, we're also changing the content of communication, okay? In a very <coughs> profound way, okay? So that's another lesson that we've learned from the work that we've been doing with mobile civil tech. Okay, so these are some of the things that we've learned. I'm gonna go briefly on some of the things we, 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 don't, we don't know uh, before I'm gonna wrap things up. And I, I hope I'll, I'll still have time to also to, to, to get some questions. So here's some things we don't know. One thing we don't know is, um, is the nature of the collective action problems. Let's, let's, uh, sorry for uh, being a bit uh, technical here. So, so here's what I mean when I, when I talk about the nature of the collective action problem. So when I hear that other people are using the system, what does it do to me? Does that increase the likelihood that I'll use the system or will that reduce the likelihood that I will use the system, okay? So, we actually don't have a good sense of what's the case. So we can think of two possibilities. One possibility is, is the possibilities of complementarities. If I know that people are using the system, it increases the likelihood that I will use the system because they can't ignore us. Okay? If only one person complaining about the bridge that is broken, they will ignore us. But if all of us will complain, they'll think that this is really serious and they'll take care of the bridge. Maybe if people think about it as complementarities. But people might think about it as substitutes. People might say, oh, you know, it only takes one person to tell that the water well uh, pump is broken, so why, why, why do I need to send a message? If, if I think that Mark will send a message, why should I? So then there's a collective action problem where, because it takes time, it takes money, it takes, you know, I need to think, I need to be, you know, I just want to go back home from like a long day at work. So, so it might be that thinking that other people are sending reduces my likelihood of sending, and we don't fully understand that. Because the, if we'll understand that better, we can manipulate people's kind of knowledge of, of how it's used by other people. And, and that's what we, these are some of the experiments that I've been doing now, is trying to manipulate information that people have about usage of other people to understand better the nature of the collective action problem. Another thing we don't fully understand is the importance of coordination in the context that we are dealing with, okay? 
So how much is it important that there's going to be people in communities that say, hey, if there's a problem, come talk to me. We should all like coordinate and send messages versus, you know, just people, you know, just, you know, the only reason why we have some villages that we have a lot of messages because you have super users that care a lot about some issues and sending you know, tens of messages. So you remember that I said that we're doing this experiment in, in, in northern Uganda where 100 villages are treated, 100 villages are controlled. We're getting on average 60 messages uh, in the last six months, but we have villages with 200 messages and we have villages with, with, with almost nothing. Okay, so we have a lot of variation and understanding this variation to the extent to which this is about coordination or just villages are lucky to have super users is another avenue of research. One way of, we're gonna address it, we, we still don't have a good answer, but one way of addressing it, it's kind of expensive, but we're doing mapping of the social network of the villages, okay? So we're doing complete mapping, and the idea to see whether villages that are sending a lot of messages have more dense network than villages that uh, uh, are not sending that, much, that many messages. Another thing we don't fully understand is what does it mean to have high uptake or low uptake? We're doing these things and people say, hey, only 5%, that's really low. And sometimes we say, well, how many like, messages we need to get about a teacher that is abusive for people to get the message, okay? Do we need thousands of messages or it's enough that four or five people consistently complain about this teacher? If, if all the information we need is about the broken well, the, 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 the water well pump is broken, like how many messages do we need? Maybe two is enough, okay? So we don't have a good grasp for, and, and I think this is related to a lot of the work that you're doing. What is the level of involvement that we need in order to say, this is actually making a difference, okay? We don't have a good sense of, of that. Um, we, we don't have a good way of mobilizing civil society. A lot of the work that has been done in this space until now is citizens' engagement directly with government. And this might be okay for some type of engagement, like water wells and, and health, but not for others, like parliament. For that, I think we need civil society but we don't know yet how to do it well. And the problem is that the technology that works well in our world uh, is not so uh, transferable, to, to, transferable to, to the context of low-income countries because people don't have access to the internet and they don't have zip codes. So when I sign a petition about defunding Planned Parenthood, all I need to do is I put my zip code and automatically it's sent to my representative in Congress. But if you're in a world without a zip code, like how do you do it? Okay, if you're in a world in which we don't have uh, a, a smartphone, it's really difficult to, to know what's your location, okay, in a world without zip codes, okay, so some, some challenges here. Um, and, and also, as I said before, uh, you know, we understand that it's important to incentivize government, but we, we, we still don't have a good handle. So we think about common knowledge, but maybe there's other ways we still don't know. Okay, so I'm on my last slide, just thinking about moving forward. Uh, you know, given the things we know, given the things we don't know, here's some things about uh, people that are working in the space, whether you are practitioners, whether you are government, whether you are, uh, um, you know, tech people and, and, and programmers. Okay, so some things to think about. The first thing is this idea that I, I've mentioned several times in, 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 in this talk, um, the, the importance of bridging the G2 and G4 world, okay? Uh, most, of, most of us, oh, sorry. Um, so most of us are working in the world that we take for granted the internet, take for granted that you know, we have Facebook and Twitter, uh, but that's not the reality of, of many of the countries that uh, I work in. And thinking about applications, thinking about platforms uh, in which uh, allow us to, to bridge the divide is, is, is of utmost importance. Unless we all say, you know, let's just wait 10, 15 years and it will be, the problem will be solved by itself. But to the extent that we, we don't want to wait 10, 15 years, we need to think very carefully about bridging this divide. Um, another thing that uh, in moving forward in this space is this is a space that relies heavily on a model of a what we can say a crowdsourced model, okay? People, we, we, we assume people have phones and people will use it and if they will use it, that's great. If not, that's too bad, okay? But there's other models, okay? So we can, we can contrast the model of, 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 uh, 
of uh, crowdsourcing, we can also contrast with the model of seed, seeding people. So I can go to villages, I can go to communities, I can give mobile phones to people and say, hey, I'm going to call, I'm going to give you a phone, I'm going to give you some airtime, and I'm just going to call you, you know, once a month with a set of questions, and if you answer, I'm going to send you a thousand shilling, you know, over the, you know, not enough experimentation with that. Or, or just saying, you know, if, if you see something, tell us. So there's an experiment that was done in, 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 in the Congo where communities got phones and they were asked, so it was seeding. They gave it to specific people and said, every time you see rebel movement, send us a code. And there were codes. One is, you know, rebels. Two, there was like rape in the village. Three, there was killing in the village. And it was all based on seed sourcing rather than crowdsourcing. Uh, so there was some evidence that actually the information that they were getting from that was more accurate than data that people have been working on on like, like media reports and stuff like that. But we don't have a good sense of when it works, how it works, and this is something we need to experiment more going into the future. I think we need a better analytics of the, the footprints of the people do with their phones in order to uh, understand better um, what people want. And I think uh, there's a lot of people here that, and probably some of the presentation that we'll hear, uh, will talk about how we can use the footprints of people, what they post, uh, what they tweet, what they call, when they call, who they call, in order to understand better what are the interests and the incentives and preferences and priorities of people. So that's another exciting uh, uh, avenue. And the last point I, I'll, I'll say is, is all of the work that I've been describing now is, a relation, is, is, is an outcome of collaboration between civil society groups, government, donors, but together with researchers, that for, at every stage of the, the process, we are involved and engaged and experimenting in order to learn about what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, research is really key for knowing, like, is what we're doing, like, impactful? Is what we're doing make a difference in the world? And, 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 and one of the goals of, of, you know, me coming here and engaging with you is also, you know, trying to get people to realize more the benefits of of collaborating with, with researchers in order to have an evidence-based uh, field rather than uh, wishful thinking. Okay, and I'll stop here. We've, we've, got time, we've got time for some questions as well. Um, and then Gemma's gonna pass the microphone around if you have uh, questions as well. Hello, uh, I'm Kirsty, University of Amsterdam. Thanks a lot, that uh, really interesting insights. What I was wondering, I, I see a bit like a gap between like the new and uh, or the, the technology level and the non-tech level. Um, and I was wondering if you have looked into more traditional and also in terms of trusted other forms of platform creation and community, uh, community creation in yeah, low-income communities, as, as you call them. So looking into traditional forms in terms of community media, community radio, in environments where these are the platforms that have been there for a long time uh, to create inter or intra, but also cross-community connectivity, collaboration, and mobilization. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and um, that's not a space that I've been working on. I mean, I've, the, the space that I've been working was mostly creating platforms uh, that communicate, that connect, not necessarily citizens, but connect citizens to um, to to government officials. Um, but I think it's an exciting, it's an it's 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 a, it's a it's an exciting uh, area of research. So one thing that I've been uh, doing as uh, um, or will be doing is some discussions that we have with um, with mobile phone providers on getting access to metadata. Um, super sensitive, super, there's a lot of privacy concerns, so we need to kind of work them out. But uh, we started analyzing metadata in some countries. So one country is Senegal, that we have good metadata. There's good metadata in, in, in Yemen that has been available to, to researchers. And what we're trying to do here is also understand not only, uh, so what we're trying to understand in, intra and inter-village communication, uh, a lot of this work is about around conflict, so how conflict affects inter-village communication. Um, super exciting, super interesting, uh, you know, takes a lot of um, data analytics. Uh, still not, not 
difficult to know how this will be uh, used to think about um, civic tech, uh, the way we kind of think about it here in terms of like, you know, raising voice. But definitely there's analytics that we can do, especially after violence. Uh, so one of the things, for example, we learned in, in Senegal is that the, the, um, the, the way communi communities have been contacting each other after like violence, it, there's a real disruption, okay? So we see a lot more communication between areas that share the same ethnicity than areas that don't share ethnicity after uh, sparks of violence. Very interesting. Hi, it's um, Patrick Olivier from Newcastle. Um, your last point, like creating collaborations between researchers and the various stakeholders and organizations yeah. involved, I'm very interested in that. So in the sense that there's actually quite a sort of uh, landscape of different types of researchers as well. So often as a political scientist, for example, political scientists might be happy to just sort of observe what goes on, theorize about it. Yeah. But obviously if you're thinking about sort of computer scientists, designers, they're a bit more interventionist in their outlook. And I'm, worrying ab I'm wondering about the balance here. Where, where should innovation come from? Because obviously, what researchers want are not necessarily what the, the society wants or the yeah. participants want. I wonder if you sort of experience those sort of tensions. Or, or yeah, so it depends a lot of them. I think so, so the key, uh, so obviously the, the you know, researchers, um, the, the, one of the big benefits is they come for free, okay? Like the only thing, so I, I, I don't work as a consultant. I only work, you know, for Bona and a lot of the people that are in my space, that's how we work. The, our payment is, is data, okay? So, so we, 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 we give our expertise for free, you know, we want access to data, but the things that we care about because we want to publish papers are not necessarily the things that, uh, the problems of the communities that, that we engage in. So the, the key for, for us for successful collaboration is, is twofold. One is to try and have teams of researchers rather than a researcher, where people bring different uh, insights. But the second thing is involving us in very early stages of the discussions, where a lot of this is about identifying the problem, trying to understand what is the thing that your partner wants to get from it, I mean, the discussions with the Ugandan parliament were, were taking over like two years, okay? And this was high level with, like, discussions with the speaker of the house, with the political parties. You know, we, we didn't just come and say, hey, let's Im implement something, you know, you know, out of thin air. So a lot of it is about making sure that each side you, understands what are the limitations and uh, interests of the other side and, and trying to be as sensitive as possible. The key thing is coming early. So when somebody comes to me and says, hey, We've done this and this and this and this. Can you now analyze the results? Usually it's too late, okay? To make some, to, to have like relearning. Relearning comes when you can embed within the design from the get-go experimentations that will allow you to address some questions of interest. For example, randomizing the cost. For example, randomizing the marketing strategy. For example, randomizing uh, aspects of the interface. You know, if, if, you, if, if, if we come at very late stage, we, we you know, our ability to influence the learning is much more limited than if we come at the, at the early stage. But at, at, at the, the, the short answer is, you know, is meet at the very early stages where everyone is very transparent about what they're trying to get from the get-go. We've got time for one more question. Hi, thanks for your um, presentation. I had a question. Um, you hadn't mentioned uh, the political context, and especially in Uganda and maybe East Africa very much. I've been there, and I, from my understanding, people are quite afraid of the government in a lot of ways. So how do you sort of adapt the ICT, or how do you approach governments in those <coughs> very different political contexts from, from Europe and the West, say? Yeah, so, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, at least in, the, in, in most of the work that we're doing at the local level, uh, that is focused on service delivery, um, there's less tensions and the stakes are lower than the presidential election. So, so we've, been veered, we've kind of veered away from the real high stakes uh, because there's some sensitivities there and in focusing on things that also the government, I mean, uh, what, we, what we encountered was that there's a lot of good willing people in the level of like, the local governments that want to improve the services but they're really constrained about the knowledge, okay? So there's, there's real constraints. So they were very, very supportive of, uh, of our effort. So on one hand, 
you know, one way of avoiding it is understanding what are the spaces that you can operate and what are the spaces. The, the office of the president was very clear on what, what we can operate and what we can't operate. But the second thing is goes back to some of the points that I raised before about the importance of anonymity and confid confidentiality. Um, not only not only the data when it comes in um, it opens as a case and it can't be traced, but also the back end doesn't even sit in the country. Okay, the back end of the data is not sitting in, in, in Uganda, is, is, is sitting in the United States. Okay, so that's like very important, and you know every, everything is like um, you know decoded and, and there's, there's a lot of, we're very aware of, 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 of privacy issues. Okay, we ran out of time, I'm afraid, okay. sorry. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Guy, again. Um, and grab him in the coffee break. <laughs>